this is corresponds to this line. So everything, all sensory motor signals are at the conscious level. So something changes in the environment, she has to be consciously change her model. That often causes the difficulties in their uh, daily life and also in the communication, because the communication is more complicated tasks for them. So I suggest that this prediction learning ideas can also uh, be a basis of the uh, design of the consciousness of the uh, human infant and So in, yes. in, in the last uh, so episode that you mentioned, um, are you completely equating conscious and attention? Yeah. Uh, conscious and attention. It seems like mm. what you said as conscious is completely the same as mm. replaceable with attention. But attention can be, uh, uh, attention is a more, how can I say, the local phenomena. I mean, the, if something the conscious level, and then we still have to can uh, assign our attention to the conscious process. So you, you're, you think that uh, there can be conscious but not attended. Mm. And in the uh, example you mentioned, this you know, ASD person in Tokyo University, she can have a uh, conscious but attended and unattended, but she mm -hmm. has a difficulty in having some process, non-consciously process. Yeah. But it seems mm -hmm. like your episode is more of the, sort of, you know, planning the behavior by attending or prioritizing some kind of plan, one over the other, or having some kind of plan in sequence of working memory, but that's mm. something that she seems to be having difficulty. So I think the uh, attention is a uh, narrower, can I say, control in a conscious process. Mm. Of course, that she can do several things in parallel. But then doing, for example, blasting their teeth and then uh, wearing t-shirts, she has to quickly switch their several processes. And there is one behavior studies measuring the attentions of their uh, ASD person, the visual attention. And actually their ASD person often changes attention target. Even without any salient event or something, they tend to quickly switch their visual attentions. So I think that such an attention switching can also happen in the other modalities as well, not only the visions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, it seems to me you can you can pay attention without learning new actions. You know, I can pay attention to the prediction of something I already have in my acquired model. A part of attention is, oh, let's see. Is, is this thing that I'm predicting happening? Yes, it is happening. Uh, so it's, I don't know, it seems to be quite quite different from attention. Here, here uh, conscious is, is this actual updating of, of model, not the paying attention to whether it is true or not. Well, maybe the, uh, in other words, the attention is kind of top-down process. We control attention, but the conscious is a kind of bottom-up processes. We don't control what is conscious or what is unconscious. But then, as a result of our behaviors, we realize this is a conscious or this is unconscious. Yeah, but even for the working for adults, uh, if we pay attention to the working itself, mm -hmm. then we, we can... Control. Yes, of course. Uh, yes. We can, of course, control what is conscious or what is unconscious. Even in the working, we can become so the conscious about the working behaviors. Working, uh, working, learning the working is uh, more conscious than that means the baby are mm. uh, more conscious than us adults. Yes, they're because the babies do not know how to walk uh, yet. I, I mean, it, in some sense, mm. just intuitive. I mean, or you can imagine when that some... The baby is born, mm. uh, she is most conscious. I think of, of what, what, what Mitsa says is that if you don't know anything about the world, everything has to be learned. Oh, okay. And at that kind of you know situation, mm -hmm. then you know according to this kind of mm -hmm. uh, framework, these kind of you know babies should be most conscious of everything. That, that's what mm -hmm. Mitsa says, right? Yes. Yeah. But uh, mm -hmm. when an adult becomes you know completely predi uh, able to predict many things, mm -hmm. then there should be no you know 
uh, necessity to become conscious of many things. So mm -hmm. adults should be more unconscious. We can, uh, of course, control that because once we acquire the behaviors, the behaviors can be encapsulated. So in that case, we don't need to take uh, care about this encapsulated process. This is this is unconscious process. But then we have another conscious level, like a going this direction or going that direction, the higher level consciousness for walking behavior. Yes. So I might have two questions. Um, just one quick clarification. I think you hit on it a moment ago, but what exactly do you mean by conscious in this particular instance, or consciousness mm. here? Oh. Are we at this? I mean, I guess I ask because something like I would see a potential problem with this would be expert skilled activity, like you know, uh, musicians mm -hmm. executing very acquired actions are very conscious mm -hmm. about everything that's going on around them. Um, but if it's more of a conscious reflection on, say, you know, the certain, but even sometimes even very certain particular elements of what they're doing, they're very mm -hmm. consciously aware of. Um, but that could also hinge on exactly what you mean by consciousness in this particular case. So. That's why I'm curious. <laughs> consciousness is very close to awareness, I think. And uh, the here, what I want to say that there are, because there, we can use many terms, but the terms does not really answer to our question, because especially uh, we are very much interested in the computational model. And then there, from the computational viewpoint, the prediction error is our, I can say, is a kind of measurement of the consciousness. I think about the prediction error, if you forget about it for now, what, what we are talking about so far is pretty clear, I mean, to you, you know, Kevin's questions. Uh, it is all about consciousness of or conscious, you know, plan about the mortal movement. Right? Mm. That's what she's talking about mm. here. Yeah, yeah consciousness always has their, yeah. no, consciousness, consciousness always about. have their target. Conscious about walking actions. Conscious about writing, actually. Conscious about speech and so on. So, so, yes. so uh, I have a, a kind of comment. So when we build a prediction model, so uh, mm -hmm. roughly we can think of two types. One is a deterministic model, uh, mm -hmm. and another is a probabilistic model. So in the probabilistic model, allow kind of a multiple possible outcomes, mm -hmm. whereas the deterministic model uh, allow only single uh, outcome with a very small variance. So, uh, uh, can you think, uh, interpret that uh, uh, feature of the ASD patients, they prefer more deterministic models rather than uh, probabilistic models? And also in the brain, the, the cerebellum uh, prediction is uh, more uh, optimized for deterministic prediction, whereas the uh, process of the cerebral cortex uh, uh, more optimized for probabilistic uh, uh, prediction. So, is there any uh, uh, study linking the relative uh, uh, the activity of uh, cerebellum and the, the cerebral cortex in the ASD uh, patients? I don't know there are uh, studies which correspond to your questions, mm -hmm. to be honest. And yeah, actually, the in our model, the robotic model, we sometimes use a neural network like model, like a deterministic model, and sometimes use the probabilistic model. And we don't also have a clear answer yet which models are better it's better reproduce the ASD and TD persons. But now we are just focusing on the prediction error, which can be measured from both uh, deterministic and probabilistic. But we don't have the clear answer yet, which is suitable to explain the TD and the ASD. Yes. So, um, it, this model um, seems to have the segregation of sensory and motor information and some predictor that sits on top. Uh, and and I, I think that, that's totally fine, but I keep wondering about how do you even know what sensory, how do you know What's motor? Aren't you kind of born into this world, and this distinction is not, not available to you. you? You have to figure it out in a sense. Mm. Of course, there, there is no real distinction between right. their, uh, for example, their, their efference copy of their uh, motor command is that one of their sensory signals for babies. Mm. But here, you you know, it's kind of explicitly known that those are the predictions that you need to optimize, and not the say the predictions of the predictor, per se. Mm -hmm. right? 
So you mean the not this one, but this one, or so it's the it's the error between your prediction over the sensory motor system. So there's oh. kind of explicit thing that you need to optimize. But this thing is not really available to you at least at the start. This, this sorry, the, this contains the all types of the sensory signals. I yep. mean, there everything can, is uh, all I can say the sensory the output the sensory, sensory signals in their uh, future event are used for the prediction. I don't say just an exact one single sensory signal. All everything. So All sensory signals are used for prediction <coughs> learning. In this model, there's like model does identified input ports. Those are your sensory information, right? You've got mm -hmm. some input ports. Those are sensory information. You've got some output ports. You place an action on those, right? That that's mm -hmm. identified in this model. And some black box predictor is always trying to do some sort of mapping here and predict the next best pattern mm -hmm. on these input ports. That's your sensor information. No, I don't say in that there are only the limited the input signals. Okay. This S is a uh, kind of vectors which can contain their uh, all sensory signals. Okay. Uh, all are avail available sensory signals are used. I'm sorry. So very interesting actually. I'm just trying to understand a little bit more on S day and mm -hmm. the bit sort of the prediction errors and the tolerance model. The many AS, uh, people with ASD uh, talks about sensory overload. Mm -hmm. Sensory overload is a uh, hallmark of the, when we interview the people. Yep. So the, when we consider the sensory overload as the, one of the most in, important subjective understanding of the programs, then the, of course, it means that they receive too much information, mm -hmm. they, and, they, and too much intense information are received by SD people. Mm -hmm. So com compared to that kind of subjective understanding of the people with SD, what this uh, particular way of categorizing that helps this to understand the deeper sort of understanding of people? This model exactly corresponds to the sensory overall mm -hmm. because this graph indicating that all each, these red lines mm -hmm. become like an awareness or conscious about for the ASD persons. Mm -hmm. For TD, although the dots, these signals are the exactly the same between this and this, mm -hmm. but then the TD persons become conscious only about these four, uh, one, two, three, four red, blue lines. But then although the SD person is in the same situation, same environmental cases, they have to look at all these red lines, which means that they have to pay attention to many, many uh, informations. This corresponds to the sensory overload. Mm -hmm. They are faced to the many different uh, informations in the environment. In the TD case, we can ignore some irrelevant information. That is the uh, strong characteristics of ASD, uh, TD. But then the ASD people cannot ignore irrelevant things. They don't know what is relevant and what is irrelevant. So they have to pay attention to many things. For example, while sitting, you don't care how soft the chair is. ASD persons often care how soft the chair is or how noisy the air conditioner is and so on. Such an irrelevant information <coughs> are often ignored in TD case. But in ASD, such information also becomes uh, under the conscious process. That corresponds to the over or hypersensitivity and overload of the yeah. sensory signals. So what helps particularly to use the term tolerance mm -hmm. helps to understand or articulate better for the, con the sensory overload condition? Do you prefer to mm -hmm. use uh, the term tolerance? Yeah, tolerance or atypical prediction learning patterns. About altruistic behavior, you first did two different models. Yes. And uh, uh, I'm wondering how much difference, uh, um. I mean, uh, if you take, given uh, the, the 
other's mind, mm. uh, intentionality of that other's mind, uh, after, or I don't know, in parallel, mm. you could uh, uh, make this uh, predictive error uh, uh, learning. Uh, uh, how, how it is mm. complicated? I, I, I mean, it could be uh, in harmony. How you, you, get rid, you try to yeah. get rid of the other's mind? Yes, uh, the uh, point is that this, this person, Paulus, suggested that these are two kind of independent uh, theories. But our suggestion is that babies may start with this goal alignment theory, which means that the babies care only about their visible actions, sequences. In the development yes, process. in the development process. But then, of course, after acquiring or after achieving some artistic behaviors, although they don't know what is artistic, but ju just by accident or based on the prediction error ideas, they achieve an uh, artist behavior. And this allows them to receive the social signals, which allows the inference to understand what is helping means. Helping can lead to the social feedback, social positive feedback. In that case, maybe they can go to this step. They now. Yeah, I would think so, because they so the inference start only so the visible information, but then the, the internal their state or the intention is invisible so state. In other mind and the constant is the rationality mm. uh, with, with other mind is uh, kind of unconscious and uh, the former is conscious. I don't. I don't say this is conscious or unconscious. This is a, another issue. Just in the development in process, the development, they place. this comes first, and then based on this, they can go into the internal their understanding of other states. Yes. So, um, when we, for example, like when we walk smoothly, mm. we are not conscious of our mm. walking, right? You said that. So yes. But uh, even in such a case. It's very impossible to think that uh, we are completely unconscious, right? So you said mm -hmm. that uh, in, even in such a case, we can conscious of something like higher thought or mm -hmm. higher plan or kind of that. So do you think we have a predictive coding system as well mm -hmm. uh, with respect to such a higher order mm -hmm. thought or judgment or kind of that? And yes. uh, do you think um, such a predictive coding system is uh, um, in general, responsible for our consciousness of something or <laughs> so first there, uh, here I showed only the one layer predictor, but then of course the, there are several multiple level of the predictors. So once the uh, like walking behaviors become the very smooth, we can encapsulate uh, we can encapsulate these behaviors, and then we can get the another level of predictions, mm -hmm. like in going somewhere forward or back and so on. So this should be. Uh, Constructed in a hierarchical way, yeah. and sorry, the, I couldn't oh, so get their question, last point. Like, so, of course, uh, suppose that we have such a higher order predictive mm. coding system. Yes. And uh, my question is that the higher order predictive coding system is also responsible for our consciousness of something. I mean, mm. such coding system, high, uh, predictive coding system, is the, the general mechanism mm. of uh, having okay. consciousness of something or like that. Do you think so? Hierarchical prediction is a general mechanism. <coughs> for well, um, I mean, I'm not sure whether or not it's uh, hierarchical or mm. which uh, stage or mm. order. But my point is that uh, such predictive coding is mm. necessary. Mm. Of yes, I think so. As I mentioned here, the prediction error corresponds to the consciousness, consciousness about their something, their target event. So there, of course, the prediction learning is the basis for uh, calculating the prediction error. It's not just at that level, but also yes, di level, yes, right? different levels, multiple levels. It's a similar question, but um, with regards to perception. Mm. So now I'm I'm conscious of. Um, of you mm. and like people I can see mm. um, but it seems to me that it's not against my prediction mm. I, I'm 
you were, I see you as I predict. And mm. so how do you explain this kind of consciousness of you? Although there is no prediction error, you can be conscious about yeah, that, yeah, I guess. Mm. I think there are two reasons. One is that there you are not, uh, you cannot completely predict the event. Although you, for example, you are conscious about my movement, but you cannot completely predict what I'm doing. So that there is always a prediction error, even you do not recognize it. Mm -hmm. That can be the one possible mm -hmm. reason. Mm -hmm. Another reason is that there uh, is a discuss coming back to the discussion about the consciousness and attention. So you can pay attention to even to the no prediction error uh, events. Mm -hmm. For example, there I can walk and I can be unconscious about my walking behavior. Mm. But I can also pay my attention to my walking behavior if I want. Even if there is no prediction error in my walking behavior, but still I can pay attention mm. to it. Yeah, perhaps mm. that doesn't work because in this case, um, in the case of walking, you, re mm. you really need to reflect. But in this case, it's not that I see you once I reflect, but mm. I, I see you without um, any higher order reflection. But perhaps the, the first option, um, if we follow the first option, perhaps it means that um, when we have prediction error, it doesn't mean that um, we become conscious of the, of the sense, of the sensation that caused the error, but it, um, it, it generates consciousness in, in, a, in a more general way. So if there's prediction error, we have a, a rich um, conscious experience. Perhaps, I don't know, I, I thought mm. that's what it implies. Uh, that, that's really a really <laughs> fundamental problem in this you know, framework of consciousness uh, uh, equating with the prediction error, actually. Mm. Because I, I, there is a colleague in my university who talks about this, so we have a lot of discussion. But you know, as you said exactly, there is a case where you show a you know, frame of the movie once in 100 milliseconds, you know, un completely unpredictable mm -hmm. from different scenes, and you can uh, every time you see a new scene, you can see consciously, you know, all these you know images one at a time. On the other hand, you can actually slow down these you know images into 500 milliseconds or even one millis one second without you know uh, uh, allowing subjects to make any uh, you know movements of the eyes. And then, if you fixate the image for a long time without moving eyes, it fades. But as long as it's like 500 milliseconds or one second or so, you can consciously see it clearly, really, each of them. And at that time, at the level of perception, it seems like, you know, there's a huge error on one hand when you present it to one at 100 milliseconds. But there are no error almost after, you know, 100 milliseconds or so, you know, for the stable presentation, right? But the conscious phenomenology-wise, it doesn't seem to be that very different, even for your suggestion about the level of consciousness. So it's, I, I think this is a really fundamental problem with this predictive framework. So one piece of data we got from the last week was that the mirror neuron system eventually, um, at first it's completely involuntary, mm -hmm. and then eventually it becomes uh, su uh, susceptible to voluntary control. And I wonder if maybe you know, the, w the way to think about this is more of a kind of uh, saliency in the sense that we have various things that have override control over our conscious experience in our brain. Because if a car is coming at us very quickly or something, we can't wait to decide, do I want to pay attention to this thing? What am I going to do? You know, it, it, basically you have to um, be able to respond in a way that you don't have control and then sort of rationalize what you did afterwards. Um, so rather than say, like, just prediction error is the only um, thing that can drive the controller, maybe what happens is that as you develop, at first prediction error drives the controller, and that's when you have the mirror neuron system be involuntary. Mm -hmm. Then as you have this sort of higher level thing come in, you can actually learn to drive the controller mm -hmm. according to other things. And mm -hmm. the things that you drive it are not necessarily restricted to be specific organic channels, but that's actually data-driven. You mm -hmm. learn to drive the controller based on what kinds of drivings work. Mm -hmm. And so you can find sort of the pathways into understanding 
what things enter your consciousness from the organic level, but at some point, learning actually may explain some of the differences that we're seeing in personal experience and things like that. Yeah, I completely agree with you that there, our model isn't uh, reproducing like uh, uh, voluntary uh, imitation behaviors because there are this action, predicted action, just generated as an R uh, to minimize the prediction errors. But then, of course, there, as this uh, the inference develops even higher level, it can also acquire the inhibition mechanism, which is uh, lacking in my model. Mm -hmm. So that once they acquire the inhibition model, they also acquire to are uh, explicitly con intentionally control uh, whether to produce this expected out or uh, their model command or not. So such a higher level, their function is still necessary for this model. Yes. So I want to come back to the topic of uh, self-awareness. Mm -hmm. So uh, you nicely show that the based on the high predictability and low predictability, mm -hmm. robot can discriminate between yes. own body and the uh, rest of the environment. But probably, so there will be further steps. For example, within this environment, there is something uh, strange or special. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he uh, finds out that uh, maybe that's uh, something similar to myself. Mm -hmm. And then later, so uh, he or she recognizes that he or herself is uh, just one of those uh, human beings. So uh, how do you think a kind of a robot or or human infants can go through those uh, steps of uh, discovery. Discovering like, an, uh, like uh, not there are, only there others, but... There are human mm -hmm. beings around, mm -hmm. and they are similar, mm -hmm. and I'm just one of them. Mm -hmm. I think that there, uh, if there, the environment is uh, occupied only self and the other peoples, mm -hmm. Infants may start with their like uh, just one cluster, but then if the environment have the object or the animals, in that case, their objects and animal clusters may separate earlier mm -hmm. than the self and others. Mm -hmm. So they have different predictabilities, and also their, for example, in case of a tool, the tool can be completely predictable when take it, but then it is not always a completely predictable. So it's a dynamic that our environmental state can be, I think there are separated earlier than the self-other discriminations, <coughs> but then the self-other discriminations gradually develops. So that's why they can uh, also uh, correspond to their <coughs> questions to Asada Sensei. Yes. So I think that the, our own models, or internal model is generated uh, without discriminating self and other first. But then gradually, their infants recognize that some entities can be perfectly predictable, but some entities are not perfectly predictable. But then the predictors gradually also separate into two or more phases. So yes, I think such a dynamic, their environment, their entities can be also put somewhere in this space. And we can show the how the certain entities are separated differently from the self and others entities. Thank you very much. I think we have to stop you for that. Okay. <laughs>